Good morning. Thank you so much for including me in your conference. I'm so sorry that I can't fly there uh, to be with you uh, for so many reasons, um, but uh, I hope this will do. Also, I'm grateful to Create Streets for letting me uh, pre-record this talk so I didn't have to get up too early uh, in Boston time. Um, many of you uh, were kind enough to send in some questions beforehand, and at the end of my talk, I will make an effort to answer as many of those as I can. So. Um, this uh, talk uh, to be descriptive perhaps about my approach uh, to the work has been called walkable placemaking, but uh, the folks at Create Streets were kind enough to do something that not all of my talk clients do, which is to say, um, Jeff, you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to call this new work. I've got a bunch of great projects that I want to show you, four to be precise. Um, each one illustrates, I think, some important uh, principles of placemaking uh, and the work that I do. Um, and no, uh, this, this shocking picture is not, uh, is not my new work. Um, this is a picture of one of the projects I'll be showing you. Uh, I just thought it would be fun to um, scandalize you a little bit with the latest in European urbanism. Uh, if you're not aware, this is a failed subdivision in Turkey that I had absolutely nothing to do with and make sure that's recorded. Uh, so um, because I'm not giving you one of my standard talks, I think it's really important that, that I direct you to them. Um, there's two talks available on TED.com. Uh, they're each 17 minutes long. Uh, one is called The Walkable City, about why our cities need to be more walkable. Uh, and the other is called Four Ways to Make a City More Walkable. This one, um, uh, this one is all words, no images. This one is all images and lots of words. <laughs> but um, you know, I give these talks all over the country, all over the world. And uh, it's really nice to not have to give them today. So thank you for your patience as we move along. I'm gonna show you four projects, uh, one in Indiana and three that happen to be here in New England, although I work all over the, mostly in the US and all over, um, uh, but one in, uh, two in Massachusetts and uh, one in New Hampshire, just north of here. Um, and uh, the one in Indiana, I, I wanna show to illustrate uh, an important point, I think about what we still seem to get wrong um, hopefully not we, we, but designers still seem to get wrong when it comes to um, what I call the, the making the comfortable walk, which is about shaping spaces. This is a project uh, now under construction uh, in Elkhart, Indiana, the expansion of a downtown core. You see the downtown on your left into a largely industrial and empty, uh, half empty area, a lot of parking lots uh, to the right. And I wanted to point out, this is a new image. Um, this, this, was, this appeared in, the, in Twitter or somewhere um, only a year or two ago. And this is a new British town center called a new town center. Um, and you can see that it's still imagined as a parking lot at the center. And of course, the first thing we learn about good urbanism is, is to hide the parking lots, but also to make space by shaping it um, with buildings. Um, this is the contrast between modernist urbanism and traditional urbanism. Modernist urbanism, of course, is, uh, and by the way, there's a lot I enjoy about modernist architecture, but modernist urban, urbanism, I think, has been recognized as a, a mistake, um, a great failure. Um, and uh, it's, it's characterized by being um, uh, object focused. The, the figural forms are the buildings themselves and not the space that, surround, that the buildings surround. So the buildings are sculptural, the buildings are meant to be viewed. Um, from every direction and allowed to be viewed from every direction. And so there's no spatial definition. Of course, traditional urbanism, the buildings take whatever forms they need to take in order to shape public spaces that are well shaped. Uh, this is not Photoshop, this is in Madrid, uh, the extreme example of the space that's fully surrounded and enclosed. I probably got this off of a Create Streets tweet. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the street spaces that we enjoy are well shaped, whether it's you know an older place. Uh, in Europe or a uh, place I worked on, Rosemary Beach uh, in Florida, uh, you shouldn't be able to see out, ideally, of a good public space. It should be well enclosed visually, uh, the alternative we understand all too well. Um, this is a recent proposal for a project uh, near Lake Forest, Illinois, where you have this wonderful town square that's quite well known from the American version of the Garden City movement. You can see how it's surrounded by buildings and that's what makes the space. And the American idea, I should, sorry, these are both American, but the more contemporary idea is, oh, look, we're going to do the same thing. <laughs> but of course, I don't know if this was ever built. Uh, complete misunderstanding 
that a space is not a space unless it's surrounded by buildings on its edges. So, uh, and, and of course the sexiest modernist new plans that we see coming out of Europe and elsewhere um, uh, fail to shade, you know, every, every space is bleeding, just bleeding, either filled with parking or just inadequately surrounded. So here we inherited a plan um, prior to this one uh, for different parts of the neighborhood. We're on the left, uh, the Northwest here, and you can see um, this was the plan. There's tons of empty parking lots all around, but they were still gonna build a parking structure. They wrapped it very intelligently. They wrapped it to hide it with buildings, but there's just zero spatial definition. The new aquatic center has the look uh, of a Walmart, right? With the parking lot uh, in front. Um, and uh, here's how we changed the plan. So first of all, um, you can see that we lined the streets that were not lined um, with buildings. Um, we created a, create streets. We cre it's not a street unless it's got buildings on it. Um, and we created a space heading towards the building and terminating the vista on the building. We also determined that uh, they didn't need to have parking in a structure, that we could take advantage of the existing surface lots and reshape them. Um, so turning that into that uh, allowed this sort of view on the street. Now we're looking towards the new aquatic center uh, down this street in that image. Uh, secondly, if you move to the right, you can see this area over here. The plan that we inherited was a new supermarket, its parking lot, and then in the classic American style, the apartment houses floating on parking lots. Uh, no street address, right? Where do you live? Oh, I'm building B, right? Because I don't have a street address. We shaped this part of the plan. Uh, we, we made a square where the street comes in by straightening it. We put a square in front of the uh, supermarket. We wrapped the parking and created uh, both a square in front of the supermarket and a, uh, a bunch of apartments and row houses that all have addresses. We even created a Riverside Drive where there wasn't one. Um, and you can see the parking is hidden. It still accesses the supermarket in the conventional way, um, but you get public spaces shaped by buildings. So um, these are under, this is under construction now um, and just shows actually, uh, to be blunt, uh, how badly urban design is being done uh, if you don't have someone involved who understands that you need to shape spaces with buildings. Um, the next project I want to show you is a large TOD, a large transit-oriented development uh, near where I live in Massachusetts. Um, this is a 10-acre, 1,000-car uh, parking facility uh, in uh, uh, Newton, Massachusetts. It's the end of the Green Line. A train comes in here from Boston. Um, everyone parks for the train. This is a hotel, kind of uh, a, a little bit, uh, a little bit old, uh, and and um, uh, you know out of shape <laughs> on the west side of the site. And um, the plan that had previously uh, been proposed for this site was essentially an intermodal center with some community buildings in the front. Uh, the uh, connections from train to bus was happening under the giant parking deck that was gonna be located there. You, you know what that feels like. And then there were these three very large residential buildings and you can see the streets are, um, they look like they're designed for moving vehicles, not for people. Um, you know, not, not the worst architecture by any means, um, but the, uh, the, 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 the only spaces that are really created are up against this street that has a golf course across the way. So not much in the way of spatial definition. Uh, another image of the plan that was moving forward, um, but actually didn't move forward because the economics didn't work. So we came back with a denser plan um, that is this one. And the basic strategy of this plan is was to uh, hide, rather than having the parking deck floating out there uh, as an object, was to hide the, uh, sorry, to hide the train tracks and the rail yard that sits back here, which creates noise and it's not very nice to look at, to hide it with a very long parking deck. And then of course, to hide that parking deck behind a very long building uh, so you don't see it. No one wants to look at the parking deck. Additionally, we separated the parking deck from the train station and the intermodal facility is now a public square. You know, why have it in the depths of a parking garage when you have all these people moving from parking to train who are there to ready to buy th things, to buy coffee and donuts or to uh, enjoy um, a cocktail or a meal uh, in a restaurant. So um, you can see the, the basic strategy was to separate, create a public space, and then to have an internal street because only an internal street could be, um, uh, could be shaped on both sides uh, by buildings. And that, that internal street 
um, is punctuated by other public spaces, a hillside amphitheater green because there's a slope from here to here. And then we're, we're calling a hotel square because this building um, is replacing the existing hotel. And then of course, a, a, a mix of uses, uh, residential everywhere. Uh, this is a large office building. This is the hotel. Um, and the retail is from this part of the parking deck all the way around here is where you have the ground floor retail. Here's a look at the, um, at the transit square, which is divided into a more paved square area where the buses are circulating and into a more green area for relaxing. So it's more active and more passive. Um, and this is the view uh, looking into the square from across the street. I think um, what I need to stress here is the, the concept of uh, the demise line. So this view here that you're looking at is into the square. And this is one building. And you can see it looks like three buildings. This is something that we've started to do maybe a decade ago uh, in the US is this fiction um, called the demise line, which takes buildings that are too large because we build too quickly these days, right? We, our, our investments of capital are too big and our things happen too fast. And as a result, if a place is to have character and also to be interesting to walk around, it's important that, uh, that there be variety. And so um, what you see here is the demise line plan, which shows where buildings are meant to look like multiple buildings or to look pavilionized. You know, this is a building of five fairly identical pavilions. These are meant to look like row houses and so on. I'll show you these as we go through the plan, but it's a reaction to this. There's this fear, and I, I didn't make this slide. There's this fear of scale in American development. You know, neighbors fight every project. Everything's considered too big. And the developer's response to this has been to break these, break our buildings down into like lots of tiny little parts, but none of them are, are, are really buildings. None of them are convincing. It just makes the building look messy and it makes the building look bigger, right? It's this big collection of all this different stuff, but no real sense of breaking down the scale. So the demise line, and this is a building in, uh, in Boston by Elkis Manfredi, um, the demise line makes a building convincingly look like multiple buildings. Um, Here's a very nice one in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, that's one building. Uh, here's an older one, also by Elkis Manfredi, um, that's in City Place in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, here's a nice modernist one, if you, uh, if you go for that, um, in um, San Francisco. But the point is, to create variety and interest along the street, you want to um, uh, have that variety be, be convincing. So you make the building look like several buildings. Now, I have a new book out. It's called Walkable City Rules. Rules not, rule 90 is break up big buildings. And I have a, a long, not long, a short, but, but a thorough conversation of this uh, issue. There is as yet no theory of demise lines, no, nor literature of demise lines, but they are used often and most often without much skill. If they are to be effective at reducing scale and creating places of character, demise lines need to follow a number of simple rules. And I go through what those are. Um, but in this project and on this map, we've broken buildings down into individual buildings. Um, and by the way, this is all pre-architecture. This is, these are facades I designed in one day uh, for the renderer, right? Uh, but eventually architects will come in and be held to a demise line rule. Um, this is the pavilionizing of a building into uh, repetitive pieces, but that can be different from each other in, in color and care and, and uh, details like balconies and awnings. Um, that was the view looking down the street here. Now turning around and looking down the street this way towards these that are demised as row houses, um, you have apartments that are hallway served, but the ground floor apartments are ground served. Uh, and so it looks like a series of individual buildings um, and these people get a stoop and a place to hang out and interact uh, with their neighbors. Of course, some of the buildings aren't demised. You have a grand apartment house down here. Uh, that's this building there. Uh, and then in front of that building, you have the hillside green that I told you about, the amphitheater green, where there can be performances on the street in front or the sidewalk. And then here's the hotel green um, as well. This is interesting down here, uh, the roof deck of the hotel, I'll show you uh, there, is demised above row houses. So the feeling of the green is to have larger buildings. Um, the big office building is here. And then smaller buildings, again, ground accessed uh, apartments that look like row houses. Uh, and uh, those happen right there. Uh, and then turning around and looking this way, of course, um, this facade was designed to uh, absorb the vista all the way from the entrance on this end. 
um, and uh, the amphitheater green climbs up the hill uh, next to it. Uh, a variety of, of architectures as well that will be given to different architects ultimately as we move the project forward. Um, and you can also see how this whole building here is a wrap that's only uh, about 35 feet thick that's hiding the parking deck uh, from view. But that's the Riverside project. Um, Kenmore Square is a much smaller project. Here I pause to sip my drink. One of the advantages of presenting from home. Um, Kenmore Square is a very important crossroads in Boston. Um, it's where two of the major streets, Beacon Street and Commonwealth Avenue, uh, cross where uh, Boston University is located, where Fenway Park, the Red Sox games are located right over here now. And it's really the gateway to the Back Bay um, of Boston. It's never been very nice. It's always been overwhelmed by traffic. Here we are looking east, um, Beacon Street coming in from Brookline where I live, Commonwealth Avenue wrapping and becoming the great uh, pedestrian mall that reaches to the Public Garden in Boston. Um, it's always handled a ton of traffic and it still does. It's really pretty treacherous to be here as a cyclist or as a pedestrian, it's not comfortable. Um, and I was um, uh, learning, I learned from what happened in, in Times Square in New York City uh, and a number of other squares where Jeanette, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, um, a different Sadiq Khan from the one in London, a great uh, traffic uh, engineer, uh, recognized that when you simplify a fork by closing one of the legs of the fork, you actually have the opportunity to create a large public space and the traffic patterns actually become simpler as well. And so you can, you can without reducing the throughput of the street, you can, um, make it a much better place to be. Um, having a five-way versus a four-way intersection allows the signal timing to be much quicker. And I should say that um, uh, when I show you this project, I have to really stress the caveat that we were not allowed by the city of Boston, and this just shows how much catching up we have to do, we were not allowed to in any way reduce the vehicular throughput of this massive intersection. So this, this uh, plan uh, had to keep it keep the cars flowing in the same number. Now, this doesn't really work as a Times Square solution. And you'll notice that there is no cross streets. It's just a simple fork. My client owned this building, which he had proposed a tower for, a hotel tower. Um, and the neighborhood had really uh, uh, stopped it because for a number of reasons. But basically, there was no good to go with the the bad, the bad being new development, new people, new bodies, new action in the square, like that's bad, but that is the perception of neighbors these days. Um, and there was no good in the sense of uh, public realm improvements that really changed or improved the nature of the square. So my strategy was to take a street through this site and to take the eastbound travel on Commonwealth Avenue and shift it to Beacon Street. That move also allowed westbound travel on Commonwealth Avenue, which was crossing through the square, making for a very complicated signal timing in this main intersection. It allows it to also take the same new street to transition westward on, uh, on, on Beacon Street, creating this very large uh, residual uh, open space in the middle, which we could then move my client's building to. And that's what we did. So here's um, the proposal that was not effective um, and here's the proposal as it now sits. You can see the building has been moved. Um, <clears throat> yes, the streets have a lot of lanes, although we've narrowed this to three. I should say, you know, with a more progressive uh, city or a more European thought process, this could be a lot better. But um, keeping the number of, uh, of, of cars constant, uh, sadly, in the day of climate change, um, has resulted in a plan that still gives us a much larger public realm uh, currently within our study area, which is this white area, the public realm is 8,700 uh, square feet. It's going to be 32,300 square feet uh, when we're done. Um, this is a view of the plaza heading, um, heading west along the, uh, at the nose of the Flatiron Hotel. Here's the plaza itself uh, on the north side of the building. Um, the building is by Studio Gang, one of very few um, contemporary architects that really understands detail and um, uh, making uh, modernism uh, interesting at every scale because of all the small facets that contribute to the design. Uh, the, the plaza is by Reed Hildebrand um, and you can see it's quite a nice change from what was there before, uh, if not ideal. 
Um, finally, uh, I want to show you a project um, in New Hampshire called Westbrook uh, because it's next to the West Running Brook that was featured in a, in a Robert Frost poem. On the site is the oldest house in Derry, New Hampshire, which is a small um, city, actually a town um, that is about an hour and 15 minutes, no, about an hour north of Boston, so not far uh, from here. Um, and it reminded me that I wanted to talk a little bit, particularly when I was thinking about this conference, about uh, regionalism and about one of the things that makes, I think, new urbanism uh, sell. And I, by sell, I mean not just people buy the houses or the rent the shops, but actually um, in, 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 in the public forum when you need to get approvals, which is so hard everywhere, but particularly um, in New England um, and the Northeast, as well as California, and maybe just about everywhere, <laughs> that um, picking up on local historical traditions uh, can be a tremendous tool towards, um, towards winning hearts and minds. Um, and you know, I, I grew up at DPZ, so I joined DPZ or uh, DPZ or Dwani Plater Zyberk, um, which is the, you know, the most important firm behind the new urbanist movement. Um, I joined them first in 1989, but then full time after a couple summers of working with them in 1993 and spent a decade there. And I want to show you a number of DPZ projects that we did together um, that illustrate this point. Um, this is the Kentlands. It's near Washington, D.C. It looks like Washington, D.C. Um, or Georgetown, right? And um, it's always been an important part of the new urbanism to reflect the local architecture. And, and this, is, this is inexpensive builder architecture done by builders who had never done traditional architecture before. And you can see that there are problems. But it really does feel um, like the mid-Atlantic and that was, um, that was essential. You'll also notice, and I love triangular spaces, you'll also notice how well the space is shaped by this triangular uh, green. Um, this is a project called Loretto Bay uh, in the Baja Peninsula, and it looks like Mexico. <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I know that, that the Create Streets folks rail against uh, international style architecture, whatever whatever type of international, but the, the whole concept that there's one style of architecture that belongs everywhere is, is contrary to making places of character. Um, this particular place being a resort um, has almost no vehicular streets. The only vehicular street uh, is this one through the middle. Um, most people arrive without cars. Um, there's no parking structure even. Um, they take a taxi from the airport uh, and uh, uh, then commences the feeling of being in this very intricate uh, town like San Miguel de Allende, but without vehicles except for bicycles. And I don't think there are even golf carts here. Um, this is Rosemary Beach, a new town in the Florida panhandle that the, 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 the goal was to make seaside better, to do another seaside, you know, the founding town of the new urbanist movement uh, to do seaside better. I, I was the project manager and spent many years working on this project. And um, it, looks, it looks like Florida, it looks like the, you know, the Caribbean, but it really looks like, uh, uh, you know, this, this is a place that had very little vernacular tradition. So it, it looks a bit like the tradition that was started by Seaside and then continued on. But it's definitely, it definitely has a, a, a Florida and warm weather feel and the architecture reflects the uh, enjoyment of the weather um, that happens there. Uh, again, well-shaped squares. The fourth side of the square is the beach um, and there are two of these uh, on the project. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Hülleburg, if I'm pronouncing that right, in, uh, in Knocke Heist uh, in Belgium. Uh, Knocke Heist is up over here, uh, and this is a public housing estate. Uh, it's not complete yet, but it's getting there. And um, we did this with Leon Creer. So this is a picture from probably 1998 a younger me in the background. Uh, there's Andres. Leon, of course. Uh, by the way, Maciej Machelski is the leading new urbanist, I would say, in Poland and someone you should all know. Uh, he's now a lot older than that. We're all a lot older. Um, but this project was a real attempt uh, to, after Poundbury, of course, to create a, uh, a real village 
Uh, none of the streets have parallel walls. And uh, I had the tremendous pleasure um, and learning experience of sitting across the table from Leon for a week. So basically he would, he would draw a plan and then I would try to make it more efficient and I'd hand it back to him and he'd make it better. And then I would get it back and try to make it more efficient. And <laughs> we did that for a week and I learned a lot. Um, but these are the images that came out of the uh, workshop and wouldn't you know it, you know, one of the great things about um, working with Duane Peter Zyberk and working with Leon Creer uh, is that the renderings end up looking like the, uh, uh, I should say the other way around, the, the projects end up looking like the renderings and um, we're very proud of the way this turned out. So when I was given this opportunity that's just now beginning the permitting process, this is a, this is a project that's on the boards right now, um, to create a small new community um, in New Hampshire, of course, I look to the best architecture in New Hampshire. I should say that this community of Derry um, has a traditional town planning ordinance of sorts that's been applied for this site. It's an ordinance that clearly learns from the early work of DPZ um, and asks for uh, traditional forms urbanistically and traditional forms architecturally. So there was no choice about which sort of direction we were gonna take it stylistically. Um, there's a Shaker village not too far away. Um, which is monochromatic, but uh, look at the incredible consistency in the way the buildings uh, are shaped. Um, but then uh, also nearby in the town of Portsmouth, there's um, uh, uh, another little village called Strawberry Bank. The whole town of Portsmouth though looks like this. It's colorful. It has a lot of gables facing the street um, and a real character. So <clears throat> this is the site. It's only about 10 acres. It's, it's sandwiched between uh, a, a small highway farms across the street, and then a, a, what may be the largest apartment complex in New Hampshire, which is stretches for acres surrounding it on this side, uh, happily um, hidden uh, by trees on every edge. Um, and this is the plan. And I wanted to point out probably the, the biggest challenge of this plan was to hide the parking. And you'll notice that you have buildings that are in many cases only 25 feet thick. These are 36 feet thick. These are 25 feet thick. The basic strategy was to, uh, and this is an existing, this is the oldest house in Derry right here with an existing uh, uh, schoolhouse next to it. Um, this is a house from the 1800s. Um, uh, in gray are the, are the existing structures. The rest are all planned to be new. The goal was to have an internal street that we could control and could in fact be pedestrian, um, but then not to expose parking lots to view at all. So the parking lots are hidden against the neighbor. And then here, of course, around the back, uh, out of view, you have a vehicular network that passes through parking lots uh, and a main street that's a mixed use uh, retail location. Um, and uh, this is a pedestrian street that a fire truck can get on, but it's not designed for that. And of course, parking hidden here, a tot lot in the middle of that. Um, and then this is the retail street, which to save money, it's really just retail. It's not multi-story buildings with mixed use in them. Uh, this is a, you see the parking under it because there's a grade difference. This is a um, apartment house of normal, you know, 60 foot thickness. Um, and this is office here. And then the rest is pretty much all residential. And this is what it looks like. So you see the, there's an existing parking lot here that we're turning into a square by treating it like a double head in park street with proper sidewalks and trees on either side. Of course, the existing trees are preserved where they ever they are found. Um, you see the 1800s house, you see the 1700s house, the existing schoolhouse. Here's the apartment house around the back. And then you have these very skinny buildings which are giving their fronts uh, to the street even though they're parked from the back, as you can see here, these are two family houses. This is an apartment building that's affordable. These are one family row houses, and these are apartments. And I'll show you those in a minute. Here you go. Uh, you'll notice the cupola on the top of this office building lined up with this street, which is slightly wedge shaped and pointed at that building. Um, these are apartment houses designed to look like row houses. So this is the entry to an elevator lobby that gets you to two apartments on each floor uh, and the, the, the two ground floor apartments have their own doors. So it's each one of these is 60 feet long, uh, three units, sorry, two units on either side of the lobby um, on three to four floors. But they're made to look like row houses. You'll notice that they repeat the basic form, but the shutters change 
the balconies change, the windows change, and the rest is consistent. These are the row houses on the other side. Um, and uh, uh, that's the view looking up and down the street. The main street is over here. You come up off of the highway and the existing school building is retrofitted with an elevator uh, and uh, 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 a cafe um, bar here, which yes, we're calling Frosty after Robert Frost. And um, the uh, existing house is there. The new one story shops with mezzanine run down the right side of the street. This building has an archway under it um, there that is allowing the parking lot uh, to exit. And then you see here the very large um, green area, uh, the hillside that's preserved over here for concerts and the street itself uh, can be shut and become a, uh, a place for performances. Um, and uh, everything looks down upon this hillside up against the building, which then is a backdrop for, uh, for um, performances that can happen in, in or in front of um, this central barn-like building. This is a brew pub um, and the shops occur along here. Um, I know Create Streets is into architecture, so I wanted to show you some of the drawings that I did to give to the renderer. Uh, you see here the elevations of the, high, of the highway front. Uh, you see here the elevations of this wall along the pedestrian street and the beginnings of the, ho of the uh, residential. Um, this is a view of across the street, the row houses, the entry square there, uh, and then of course the existing buildings and the brew pub to the right, uh, a shot of these shops coming up the street and then looking down the main street and the arch into the parking archway building. Costs more, but it's so worth it. <laughs> and uh, now of you looking the other way at the existing buildings and the new ones surrounding them. Um, but you know, it's so, it's so nice to be able to work in a simple traditional idiom that picks up on local shapes and forms um, that's consistent, but then you have variety within the consistency um, and gives you a sense of, of authenticity and character by being different from other places, but like where it is. Uh, so that is, um, that is Westbrook. So I hope these projects have been useful in illustrating some concepts that we bring to our work. Um, now I have about 15 minutes. Uh, I want to answer some of the questions that I received. Let me first point you to some resources. I mentioned the two TED Talks at TED.com. I really do hope you'll watch them. If you found this, if you found this interesting and want more, it's a great way to spend your lunch. Um, and you'll find them under my name, which is S-P-E-C-K um, at TED.com. Um, the, the book that, that really did more um, for spreading these ideas in America than, than, than any other, I think, is my book, Walkable City, which came out in 2012 and is still um, really selling well. This is the book for people who want to, con who either just enjoy reading because it's a fun book to read uh, or want to convince other people that walkability is important. Uh, yes, it's about America, but it's been published in six languages and people, um, including English, <laughs> seven including English, and um, people have found, you know, they, they, they read it critically and they understand that most of it applies to where they are, but perhaps not all of it. And I think you have the intelligence to figure that out, what applies in Europe and what doesn't. Uh, the new book I mentioned, Walkable City Rules, is available now. Um, and then... My website is jeffspeck.com and this will access you to a whole bunch more talks, a whole bunch of more talks like this, um, as well as to a whole bunch of more projects like the ones I showed you. So I hope you will go to jeffspeck.com to find out more about this work. Here were your questions. So um, I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, I, could, I, I would like to spend an hour on each of these. And I cut a few of the questions because I just didn't want to answer them. <laughs> but here are the ones I want to answer. Do you think some of the changes in street use we've, we've seen during COVID uh, will be temporary or permanent? <clears throat> I think you know the answer to that as well as I do. There are certain communities which are clamoring right now to keep them. So uh, COVID has provided a really interesting opportunity to make change, to be experimental. Um, and uh, a lot of people have fallen in love with the changes. I think it's much easier to fight and keep, fight for and keep things like sidewalk dining or parking spaces that have been turned into um, dining than it will be to keep reduced number of lanes of driving. 
Um, but I think it's important to understand that um, uh, the number of cars we get in our streets will be the numbers we allow. And if cities are functioning well without those extra lanes of driving, they can continue to do so. What's the most positive and effective urban response you've seen to COVID? Um, my favorites are actually the ones that do uh, reduce the, the, the number of travel lanes because we're learning that we didn't need them. And we're learning now, for example, in Brookline, Massachusetts, where I live, um, we're learning so far we can keep it that way. Um, we have a street that runs out right outside my window called Beacon Street. It heads into Kenmore Square that I showed you. And it was two travel lanes each way around a median with a train in it um, and parking. And rather than just removing the parking and turning it into expanded sidewalk and restaurant dining and other things, they removed one travel lane, put the parking in the street and uh, uh, therefore kept the parking, uh, added the dining and the streets now one lane in each direction and it's working just fine. We have these all over that we've been doing, actually not as many as I would hope, um, but those are the solutions that I think are, uh, have the most legs and, and change our cities in ways that really matter. Does the phrase walkability risk ignoring the socioeconomic challenges facing some communities? Socioeconomic, no. Um, how do we design walkability in a way that helps vulnerable communities? So everyone needs to walk. And in fact, the, the, more, um, the, 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 the more at risk you are, or the more you're part of an ignored or disadvantaged demographic, the more you are uh, poor, the more you are too old or too young, um, the more you need walkability. Now, and, and I'm sorry, the more, the more you do walk, the more you take transit, which involves walking, the less you drive. And I guess the way to put it best is, um, driving, is driving trends wealthy and driving trends white and driving trends uh, privileged. Now, walkability is an ableist term, and I didn't realize that until I wrote the book, um, I, I get some comfort from my friends in wheelchairs, many of whom call what they do walking when they're rolling around. And I think we need to remember that anything you do to make a city more rollable uh, and better for wheelchair access and stroller access and, and you know, ramped to satisfy that makes it more walkable as well. And I don't know anything that I've ever worked on to make a city more walkable that made it less rollable. I think it's important though in using this term, which no pun intended has legs, right? Walkability I found is the best way to sell new urbanism and the best way to sell traditional urban design practice. Um, we need to remember though that it is an ableist term and, and therefore we have to, to um, pay attention to the needs and remember to mention, which I often forget to do, to remember to mention the needs of those people who can't walk, um, who are still better served by walkable communities than they are um, by driving communities. And then the, there's a great new book it's really about America, but it's so applicable elsewhere called Right of Way by Angie Schmidt. And Right of Way uh, talks about what I also mentioned in my books, which is that if you are, um, if you are vulnerable for whatever reason, uh, you are much, much more likely to be killed uh, as a pedestrian. And our pedestrian death rate has been going up a percent a year every year for the last decade. Uh, and uh, it's, it's shocking, mostly due to SUVs and the height of the hood. And the fact that if you're hit by an SUV, uh, you go under the car and not over the car, all these things. Um, the pedestrian death rate is skyrocketing, at least in the US, despite vision zero attempts in a number of our cities. Um, and it's important to understand that, that you need to design for safety, um, first and foremost, uh, to protect the vulnerable. Why are one, one way streets such a bad idea? Can they work well in some narrow streets? One way streets aren't necessarily a bad idea, one, sorry, multi-lane one-way streets are such a bad idea. And I don't know what the European model is. I don't think I've seen this much in Europe. It's hard for me to remember seeing many multi-lane one-way streets in Europe, but they're, they're, they exist all over the US. It was a standard in the 70s and 80s and 60s and 90s to turn, to turn um, multi-lane, you know, two-lane, two uh, two-way streets into one-way two-lane streets. And those statistically are much, much more dangerous and much worse for business um, and even worse for crime than uh, one-way streets, sorry, than, than two-way streets. We have the data to show it. When you take one of these streets that's multi-lane one-way and turn it back to two-way, 
um, crashes go down probably 50 to 50 percent or so, um, and crime even drops. So um, there's no nothing wrong with a one-way street. Probably if it's a skinny one-lane street, just don't do it. Um, don't do it with multi-lane streets. What are the main reasons people resist allocating more space to pedestrians? Do you think resistance is decreasing or changing? I do think resistance is decreasing. Uh, it's been a constant trend over the 25 years that I've been doing this work to see resistance decrease. However, there is not, there are not main reasons that people resist allocating more space to pedestrians. There's only one reason. <laughs> and that reason is that they don't understand how driving and congestion works. They don't understand the law of induced demand. They don't understand that in any system, the amount of congestion you have is constant. In, in a congested system, the congestion is the constant, whether it's two lanes, three lanes, four lanes. The amount of traffic you have is a function of the number of lanes you have because of what are, what's called latent demand. If you have a congested system, the principal thing impacting the number of people driving in that system is the congestion. So when you reduce the congestion, you actually invite more trips. In the typical smaller American city, when you reduce the congestion by adding lanes, you typically take a rush hour, which is expanded perhaps to an hour and a half, and, and it contracts back to half an hour because people realize that they can commute more on peak instead of spreading their trips out. People make all these choices. They move further away from their jobs. You know, if, if, when you build a highway you, 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 or you widen the street or you remove the parking or do anything to increase flow, uh, you're actually uh, changing behavior. And the same thing happens in reverse. A number of highways have been taken down, lanes have been narrowed and other things have happened to streets like the Chang Ye Chen Expressway in Seoul, Korea, which was taken down and there was no you know, uh, uh, um, traffic uh, apocalypse. Uh, the trips just went away. And so if more people understood that, they would not resist allocating more space to pedestrians. If you were talking to a mayor of a town or city where people are genuinely at present very reliant on cars to fulfill their daily needs, what three trips would you give to start the journey to walkability? So um, that is your typical condition in the US. And most of the communities that I work in are very resistant to reducing the throughput of their roads. Um, and so what we do is we actually find those streets that aren't congested. And every city I've ever worked in has streets, important streets, or at least streets people live on or work on or shop on that aren't congested. We take those streets and we fix them first. So I think the first tip would be simply um, do a lane audit and figure out every possible lane you can remove or lane you can narrow. We have many lanes in the US that are 12 feet wide um, the standard used to be 10 feet. We're making it 10 feet again. Um, and uh, you, you can find a tremendous amount of room in our streets, at least, by making the lanes narrower. I would think in Europe, you could go down to, to nine feet. Um, uh, you know, here, here it's, it's more difficult. But uh, do a lane audit, both the number and the width. Secondly, more housing in downtowns. Find the parts of your city that are already walkable and bring more people there by subsidizing large amounts of attainable housing. That's how you create a greener city um, and a more walkable city. And I guess the third thing would be to um, invest in transit and cycling because of course you can have a walkable neighborhood uh, without them, but you really can't have a walkable city without a way to get from neighborhood to neighborhood. So if your city is of any size, um, transit is so important as a, uh, uh, you know, a key feature in making walking useful. And then finally, uh, there will be some British politicians and officials watching from your experience in the US, what might your key messages to, to them be? Here I have my last image, which is, you know, I, I lecture all over the world and particularly in South America and other places where uh, they are developing. Um, and I say, don't repeat our mistakes. And I can say that in many languages. Um, here on the left is the suburban sprawl model, which we developed to perfection in the United States over 20 years and then uh, spent the next 50 years putting everywhere. And the vast majority of our landscape looks like this. The uses are large, they're single, and they're separated. And this image Ill, uh, uh, actually lies about how close they are uh, to each other. Of course, they're further apart than this. On the right is the traditional neighborhood model. It's the same stuff, but it's small, it's intermixed, uh, and uh, it is easy to get from one to the other. Additionally, you'll notice the block structure. On the left, you have what's called a dendritic or a branching street network. Very few 
uh, very only one way to get from anywhere to anywhere else. Every trip relies entirely on this collector road. Um, if you so much as have one engine fire uh, on the collector road, your whole city shuts down for an afternoon. It, ironically, it was designed around cars and it does not work as well for cars as the traditional neighborhood of blocks. <clears throat> there are 21 ways, I believe, to get from this corner to this corner. Um, so if there's something going on in any of your streets, you can get around it. And of course, because each street is small, each street is walkable, unlike this collector road where the only people walking on it are uh, vagrants or people whose um, engines have caught fire. <laughs> so um, as you uh, develop policy, and, and I, I'm telling you this fully aware that uh, your government uh, and some of our governments uh, have been talking about this for decades, but new stuff is being built every day and there is still new stuff allowed to be built uh, according to this model, which is incredibly unhealthy, unsustainable, and, and economically uh, not, uh, doesn't pay for itself. If you don't believe that, then go to the Strong Towns website, Strong Towns, to learn why this model, um, which spreads everything out and requires three times as many pipes, um, is so e economically uh, inefficient. Um, so for a healthy community and a healthy country, you need to organize, orient your policies around supporting more of what's on the right and uh, banning uh, what's on the left. So that's my answer to your last question. Um, I'm super grateful for your attention today. And uh, what should I end on? I'll just end with my website. Please go to my website, <laughs> but I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, it's been a real pleasure having the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I look forward to hearing feedback from this uh, session. And thanks again to Create Streets.